meditate and there's a Dharma talk at the same time. Make sure that the Dharma talk stays in the background. Your breath should be in the foreground. Because that's what you're here for, to find the Dharma that can appear when the mind settles down and stays with one object. We think of the Dharma as being words, but that's only one aspect of the Dharma, and it's only the very beginning aspect. Traditionally, there are three kinds of Dharma. There's the Dharma that you memorize. These are the words that have been put down in books, put down in, well, before there were books, there were palm leaves, and before there were palm leaves, was the words that were memorized. It's like a map. But just memorizing the words, looking at the map is not going to get you to where you want to go. First you have to think about it, try to understand the map and figure out what it corresponds to. Those little symbols on the map, what do they correspond to when you look out around you? It's like taking a map with you as you drive down the road and trying to figure out which symbols on the map correspond to which roads, which turnoffs. That's thinking about the Dharma. The driving down the road is the actual practice, and it's only through the driving that you get to where you want to go. So as you're focused on the breath, that's the driving, and you refer to the map only when you're doubtful, things don't seem to be right, or when the navigator is sitting next to you on the the right hand seat says, whoops, no, we missed that turn off. That's what the Dharma talks for, is to be in the background. In case you slip off the breath, we're right here to say, no, you missed the turn off. You missed that little turn in the breath. Let's go back. Try to make sure that the talk is not a hindrance to your meditation, because the mind has enough hindrances on its own. The traditional list is five. And those are five large categories. You, as you probably noticed, the mind has all sorts of ways of elaborating the different ways it pulls off from the breath. But the five categories are useful to get a handle on what's happening. So you figure what to do about it. sensual desire, and ill will. These two correspond pretty roughly to the greed and aversion as unskillful roots. And then the last three of the hindrances deal with delusion. There's sloth and torpor, the delusion that comes when there's not much energy in the mind or their energy level is too low. Restless and anxiety, the delusion that comes when the energy level is too high. And then uncertainty. And John Lee has an interesting analysis of this one. He says that this is when you're not really true in committing yourself to the practice. And part of your uncertainty may have to do with your past experiences. You're not really sure what's the right way to handle things. Sometimes you're not even sure you're on the right path, or this is the right meditation technique for you. But the only way you're going to find out these things is to commit yourself, to say, let's go ahead and just give it a try. Do your best. In the canon, uncertainty is caused by not looking in an appropriate way at what's skillful and what's unskillful in your mind. In other words, the appropriate way of looking at these things is to see well, what's causing suffering and what's not. You look at your thoughts as part of a cause and effect pattern. And when you can deal with that in the proper way, okay, then you find that the other hindrances begin to fall away as well. 
this ability to see them simply as events in the mind rather than, than entering into them as worlds. Because when you enter into them as worlds, you start siding with them. The things for which you feel sensual desire really are worthy of desire. They're really desirable. The things for which you feel aversion really are bad. When you're sleepy, well, it's a sign that the body really does need some rest. And when you're worried about something, restless and anxious about something, well, you can find all kinds of reasons why you should be restless and anxious. That's precisely what you've got to see through, is this willingness to side with these things. And one way to cut through that is to keep reminding yourself, just look at this as an event in the mind, part of a chain of causes and effects. Where do these thoughts come from? Where do they lead? Why are they taking over the mind? Sometimes it's through your views. Buried someplace in the mind is the idea of what you're really going to find happiness through these things. You've got to ferret that out and question it. This is why a lot of the techniques for dealing with the hindrances have you look at the object of the hindrance in such a way as to discourage your fascination with it. In other words, if there's sensual desire for something, look at the drawbacks. If it's lust for a person, well, look at the drawbacks of, of lusting for that person. If it's greed for an object, look at the drawbacks of what would be involved in trying to gain the object, keep the object, maintain it. If it's aversion for somebody or something, we'll try to look for the good side. In other words, you're focusing first on the object so you can loosen up that strong fascination with it. That's what enables you to look at the mind state just in and of itself. You can ask those questions. If these mind states were movies, would you pay to watch them? Most of the time you wouldn't. Or do these mind states really have anything new and interesting to tell you? Most of the time it's just rehashing old stuff over and over again. Wouldn't it be better to try to see if there's something new, something different? Where is the new and different thing? It's right here. Seeing what new and different things can happen to the mind if you really get it to settle down and be concentrated. As the Buddha said, you're, we're here to attain the un unattained, to reach the as yet unreached, to realize the as yet unrealized. In other words, there's new things that we don't know about, we haven't experienced yet. When are you going to have enough of your old rehashing of your desires and your aversions and the things that you worry about? If sloth and torpor is the problem, you do what you can to energize yourself. First thing is to change the object of your meditation. Now, if it's the breath, you can just change the way you breathe so it's stronger, more forceful, more energizing. See if that helps. If that doesn't help, maybe you have to find a topic to think about that you find more interesting, that's more engaging. Look through those ten recollections in terms of recollecting the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, the times you've been generous in the past, the times you've been virtuous in the past. Those last two are to give you a sense of confidence. Or you could contemplate death. Ask yourself if a particularly gross hindrance is going through the mind, would you be Happy to die right now with this sort of stuff going through your head? He says, well, no. What would you like to have as your mind state when you die? Because you never know. As the Buddha said, it's the person who says, may I live for one more in-breath and out-breath, so I'll have a chance to practice the Buddha's teachings during that in-breath and out-breath. That's the sort of person who counts as heedful. If 
those topics don't wake you up and get up and do some walking meditation. Give it a few minutes and you find that you're still sleeping, okay, that's a sign the body really does need to sleep, really does need some rest. Lie down, and before you fall asleep, remind yourself that as soon as you wake up you want to get up. Continue practicing. In other words, drowsiness like this is something you have to test to make sure it's not simply boredom or the mind playing tricks on itself. The restlessness and anxiety. One of the traditional recommendations is to try to breathe in such a way as to give a strong sense of rapture, real fullness throughout the body. Think of every little cell in your body being really full of energy as you breathe in. And then when you breathe out, the energy doesn't get squeezed out. It still stays full. And then more energy comes in to make it even fuller or saturated. Ask yourself, what kind of breathing would feel really gratifying right now, even if it's just one really good breath? And see if you can let that sense of gratification pull you away from your restless and anxious thoughts. Another way is to deal with the, the reason for your anxiety. It's probably part of the mind that's telling you that you've got to worry about this. If you don't worry about this, you're leaving yourself exposed to lots of dangers. Or remind yourself that going over and over and over these thoughts is going to wear you out. I mean, there's a certain amount of preparation that's prudent. But a lot of it is just excess spinning of wheels which instead of putting you in a better position to deal with future dangers, is actually going to put you in a worse position. You're going to be worn out. So remind yourself of the wisdom of charging the batteries of the mind, so that regardless of what happens, you're ready for it. As I was saying this morning, there is so much change in the world, it's particularly evident right now. But the wisest way to prepare for all this change is to make sure that the qualities of your mind are really strong, that your concentration is strong, your discernment is strong. And we can sit down and read the newspapers and have no idea what's going on. As we've seen, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Most of the important stuff goes on behind the scenes. It comes out only when things begin to unravel. We have no idea how much more is still left behind the scenes. So you can be thoroughly informed, read all the newspapers, get all the information off the internet, and still not be prepared for what's going to happen. Your best preparation is to charge the batteries of your mind. Stoke up on those qualities of mindfulness and alertness, virtue, generosity, the things you're really going to need regardless of what happens. So these are some of the ways of dealing with the hindrances. If you find they're getting in the way of your concentration, keep that fact in mind that they're not your friends. All too often we view the practice as our enemy, something that lies as a big responsibility that we try to avoid. And that's an attitude you've really got to question, you've really got to take apart. Because the attitude itself is an enemy. It's going to destroying the wealth that you could develop inside, destroy the preparations you can make for having an inner stronghold. When the situation outside gets difficult, unpredictable, turbulent. You want this stronghold inside. To have a safe place to keep all your good qualities, and they'll be near to hand when you need them.
So as the Buddha pointed out, the, the way we feed our hindrances is to apply inappropriate attention to them. In other words, you don't look at them in terms of the Four Noble Truths. You don't see what suffering they're causing. You just ride with them. The way to starve them is to develop appropriate attention. Look at these mind states simply as that, as mind states, part of a chain of cause and effect. And see where these chains of cause and effect cause harm and suffering to the point where you get tired of them. You want something better, something new, which can be found only through the concentration. Even though you may have hit a plateau, your concentration doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Sometimes it's a necessary part of the practice is to learn how to consolidate a particular state of mind, a particular level of concentration before you can move on. And sometimes it's simply a matter of learning to look more carefully. When things get boring, it's a sign that you're not looking carefully enough because there's a lot going on. The mind is engaged in a lot of different kinds of fabrication, making a lot of choices all the time. When your mind is still, that's the ideal opportunity to look more deeply, look more precisely. You use more sensitivity, try to get more and more to the details, because that's where the action is.